It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've got a confession to make. This is actually my very first visit to this fine state and this incredible city. And now I'm wondering why it took me so long. And as Skip mentioned early on, the relationship between Rwanda and Arkansas goes way back and is extraordinary. And that makes it all the more special for me to be here. And with some friends over breakfast today, I was asking myself, what is this connection and, and why is it so powerful? And just from what I've seen, uh, I think I'm starting to understand it a little bit better. Arkansas, like Rwanda, is landlocked. Uh, Arkansas, like Rwanda, has produced incredible leaders, fantastic leadership that has really shown both this nation and Rwanda on its part has shown the world what can happen through partnership and through optimism. So thank you all for, uh, for having me here today. Uh, my journey actually started off when I was just a kid. Uh, I was 14 years old, grew up in uh, middle class suburbs of New York in a place called Connecticut. And in 1984, 1985, the Ethiopian famine hit. And across the screen, those of you who were uh, watching it then probably recall seeing these incredibly terrifying images of starving Ethiopians. And I was moved at the time. In fact, I was so moved that a couple of years later, after starting an organization that raised funds to do some good in the world, I found myself in Ethiopia. And I got on a little plane, went out to literally the middle of nowhere up in northern Ethiopia, and get out of this plane in a grassy field, and hundreds of people start surrounding me. And I'm with a, a small group. And they run over, and they're pointing at me, and a couple kids grab my hand and take me on a walk. So we walk a couple of kilometers uh, with the cattle down a road to a mud wall classroom. And up on the wall is a poster that my friends at high school had put together three years before. And it's got our pictures on it. And the kids had recognized my picture, and so they pointed me out and grabbed me. And that was my aha moment of, wow, this world is so incredibly small. What's going on, and why is poverty so terrible, and what can we do about it? And I have, over the last 25 years or so, been, now you can really figure out how old I am. No, actually, it's almost 30 years, uh, <laughs> if you want to try to age me. I have been trying to figure out how to make a contribution in a dignifying way. And it was really in Rwanda, where I moved with my wife just about 10 years ago, that I think we have caught on to some insights in a nation that is loaded with optimism and vision uh, that I think provide some lessons for the world, uh, not just for Africa, not just for uh, for the poor, but um, for all nations and all places. So let me start off here. Ooh. Am I, what do I point to? Is it the top button? Yeah, that's what I'm trying. I can do it here. So how many of you all have been to Rwanda? OK. How many have lived in Rwanda? I know who you are. <laughs> uh, so Rwanda is right in the very heart of Africa. And its population these days is pushing about 12 million. Kigali, as you can tell, is right there in the center. And we moved in to a house that we lovingly uh, referred to as the Soprano House. It had these incredible uh, columns and uh, was really spacious. We moved in there uh, late in 2005, early 2006. And we were living just a couple blocks from the Hotel de Mille Colline. How many of you have seen the Hotel Rwanda? So almost everyone. And I think that is really what people conjure when they think about what is Rwanda. 
What we found, though, was something completely different and unexpected. Uh, we found a country that was safe and secure and incredibly beautiful that had a president who said, we want to be the Singapore of Africa. And we have tried to get behind that vision over the years. Uh, but the initial reason that we moved there uh, was in part that my wife had really had it with the weather of Manhattan. Uh, I guess uh, we got out just in time, or at least 10 years early, because the weather wasn't so good this winter either. And I, we went because I wanted to work in public health and wanted to bring great management solutions to the health facilities that were in Rwanda. My wife is very wise, and she decided she did not want to work for me, even though she's got a public health degree from Harvard and she started working with the orphans of the genocide. I was out working in the field, and in particular in a little community at the very epicenter of the genocide. So over 80% of all the people in this community were murdered in 1994, and it was a very desperate place. Uh, hunger was rampant, there was no access to water, and the health center when we first got there was actually locked, its gates were closed. Over the next several months, we worked to reopen the health center uh, because we had one belief that in order to transform a community, the very first thing you've got to do is make sure that children don't die from malaria or diarrheal disease and that families can live with the security knowing that they're going to have access to health care. So that health center uh, in Mayanje opened up and has been open 24 hours a day, seven days a week ever since and never received another donation after our first year or two of work there. Because one of the fun things about working in Rwanda is that the government actually cares about the public's health and about the public's prosperity. And actually, I got into trouble. Uh, this is Jacqueline. <clears throat> after we had the health center open in Mayanje for about six months' time, Jacqueline came up to me one day, and she was screaming at me. She said, I'm so mad at you. I used to have a job in this community. And I said, well, Jacqueline, what, what was that job? I mean, what were you doing? And she said, well, I used to be in charge of the funerals. And I would get paid a couple of Rwandan francs for every funeral that I organized. But over the last several months, no one's died. And now over the last several years, people stopped dying there too. Uh, but actually, she's become a very successful pineapple farmer, so you should not worry about Jacqueline. She's doing just fine. So while I was out in the field working on all these health centers, which I continue to do today and, and I'll come back to, uh, my wife was back in Kigali, and she was scratching her head because working with the orphans of the genocide, she realized something incredibly important. She realized that more than anything, what these kids wanted were jobs. And so one day I was out in the field, she calls me up and she says, she says to me, I, I think I've got a solution. I'm gonna start a coffee shop. So she was a recovering barista from Starbucks. And she, uh, she said, you know, I'll start this little coffee shop we'll sell coffee, we'll get some plastic chairs, and all will be well and I'll create jobs for these kids. I said, honey, I want to get behind that 100%. You know, we'll, we'll, we can finance that. And a couple months later, <clears throat> some people decided to invest in a much larger coffee shop in Rwanda. Actually, a coffee shop so big now that they've got outlets in Washington, in Boston, uh, all over the place, and many, many, many in uh, Rwanda. She said, well, instead of starting a coffee shop, I think I'll start the top gourmet restaurant destination in the country, and I'll build it from the ground up. So there's Alyssa, and uh, that is on the grounds of heaven, as she was building it in a language that she did not speak at the time, uh, while pregnant with our first child. So she worked her tail off, built that incredible terrace overlooking the city, and opened 
this restaurant. And that restaurant has really become my greatest teacher in development because I went to public health school, uh, I studied development, I read all the literature, and I really thought that I knew something about how to help the poor. But it's actually been working often behind the bar, uh, often in the kitchen at Heaven, that I've really gotten even better insights about what's required in order to end poverty and help people in a dignifying way. So this is a terrace, obviously before service. And it's worth noting that when I actually wrote this book, Heaven was still struggling. Uh, it was still a really, really tough business. Uh, maybe we would see 25, 30 customers a night. Uh, there were always problems in the kitchen, always problems with staff, and so much so that at the end of the book, one of the questions that I posed was, I don't know if we're going to be able to stick around. I don't know if we're going to be able to handle Rwanda. I don't know if we're just going to pass this on. <clears throat> and over the last two years, Rwanda has really been discovered. Tourism has gone through the roof. People come not just to see the grills, but they come to do safari. They use it as a connecting point for other countries in the region. They've realized that it's safe and secure and beautiful. And the customers have been coming in to Heaven. Uh, the service staff and the whole team at Heaven have been uh, realizing increasing incomes, to say the least. Uh, so this is actually the whole Heaven team uh, just a couple months ago out on that terrace. You might all wonder, I mean, well, what does a gourmet restaurant or serving up great guacamole have to do with ending poverty? I mean, really, isn't it just a gimmick? I mean, isn't this some sort of, uh, some sort of myth? Not at all. What we have found is that everyone who comes in and gets trained at heaven creates opportunities for themselves to pay for their university education, to pay for their kids' educations, to pay for their brothers and their sisters, uh, to really figure out a way to pull themselves up. Solange uh, is actually our sous chef. And Alyssa discovered Solange eight years ago uh, cleaning the floors at Heaven. And one day, she found her in the kitchen uh, cooking a meal. And Alyssa said, oh, what are you doing? And Solange said, oh, I'm working on staff meal. So Alyssa was curious about what was going on. So that evening at dinner service, she said to all the staff in the kitchen, I saw Solange in there cooking the meal for all of you. What was she doing? I mean, you're the cooks. And they said, oh, yeah, well, we're the cooks, but she's the best cook, so she makes our meals. So Solange stopped cleaning the floors at Heaven and started moving up through the ranks. She has now worked and trained under three Michelin-starred chefs at Heaven, and she makes everything so well. And the real lesson from Solange is, we never took a 501c3 donation to pay for Solange's salary. Uh, she never received a donation of anything in her entire life, and yet today, She's able to uh, walk around in the clothes that she wants. She's putting herself through university. She's doing just great. And that begs the question of how do you actually have the greatest impact on the lives of the poor? Do you do it through traditional giving and traditional charity, or do you do it through investment, investment in businesses, investment in people, investment in ideas? And I'm on the fence on this one, because Rwanda is an exceptional place where Investments in public health, for example, pay off incredible dividends, as they did, as you saw, with, uh, with Jacqueline and, and with the community of Mayanje. And on the other hand, through the lens of heaven, we've actually seen how that job creation is what's most needed in the country. So I don't have all the answers for this, but <clears throat> this is a health center that was in part funded by the good people of this great state. And 
it is uh, up very close to the Virungas. It's, it's uh, not very far from where you can go track the famous gorillas in the mist. And the day that our organization, Health Builders, opened that health center, the government was paying for all the salaries of the nurses, all the salaries of the staff, and the community, through co-payments and national health insurance, was paying for all the rest, pharmacy and everything. Now that's dignified development, and that's really the way it should be. And I think it's a shame that if you run your hand across Africa and so many countries, there are very few places where you find the leadership, the government leadership, the transparency, anti-corruption practices that actually allow for that kind of good development from happening. And that's one of the reasons that we've stuck around Rwanda all these years. The other bit that I've really learned from Heaven is how critically needed are management systems. So this is sort of the less sexy side of development, but we have found in health centers that the way to have the greatest impact is not to send a bunch of doctors, not to train a bunch of nurses, but to work on QuickBooks, to work on accounts, to work on human resources, to work on pharmacy stock. It doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but that's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to having real health impact. So we're not leaving Rwanda anytime soon. We actually have a plan now uh, in cooperation with the government to finish that primary health care system. So there are actually dozens of facilities just like this one that we hope to build over the coming years. And we really want to see Rwanda become one of the first countries, if not the first country in sub-Saharan Africa, to have complete access to primary health care. Because that facility right there is delivering about 60 babies a month, seeing 150 patients every single day. It's where community health workers meet. It's where kids get immunized. It's really where uh, basic health care gets delivered, and yet no donations are required to keep it running. And if you get the chance to come to Rwanda to actually see it, that will be one of the most striking aspects of it, is that the government of Rwanda is the first to say, we don't ultimately want handouts. What we're looking for are investments in our country. We're looking for businesses. We're looking for people to come up and set up another heaven, another hotel, uh, another business, an IT firm. That's actually what they're driving for these days. Um, I, I wanted to comment a little bit just on Alex's remarks. I, I believe that we have not made sacrifices in order to live in Rwanda and have the life that we are enjoying over there. We've got incredible climate. I thought I was going to have incredible climate, by the way, here, because two days ago I saw that 80, 81, and I thought, oh, I'm going to feel at home here, because that was the high in Kigali that day. And then I rolled into town, and it seemed as though winter was back. But uh, we have deeply meaningful lives, uh, really wonderful lives. Our three kids, and uh, three kids were in the process of adopting, um, just love it there. And we can't think of being anywhere else, because to have the opportunity to make a contribution, which is not that traditional form of charity, but is really a form of giving in which you're helping people realize their potential, that's something that feels easier to me to do in Rwanda than almost anywhere else. So I really appreciate all of you coming out this evening. I would love to engage in a discussion and talk with you more about what's happening there. And uh, as I said, you're all invited to heaven. We got three rooms there and uh, fantastic mojitos. Uh, drink on me if you come. Just, uh, just point yourself out uh, in the crowd around the bar. And uh, please do come because I think there is an instinct that people want to feel that they can have impact in a week or two. Uh, and I get emails all the time from people saying, I really want to make a difference. Uh, I'm coming out for 10 days. What can I do? And I tell people, don't worry about that impact side. Because if you come out, if you spend money, if you do tourism, if you tip your servers at Heaven or any other restaurant that you might go to, you are having social impact. You are making an incredible contribution uh, to the lives of 
everyone in the country. So don't hold back, put it on your list of vacation destinations. We've got lovely weather, fantastic places to see, and uh, great guacamole to eat. Thanks so much. Okay, he's going to take some questions. So uh, anybody raise their hands if you have a, have a question about, yes, with microphone coming at you. Hi, Josh. Thanks you, thank you for being here in Arkansas. First of all, love the book. Thank love you. learning about your family and the, and the journey there. I've got a, about a six-part question. So uh, oh, first boy. of all. Better take notes. Uh, I think it'll be <laughs> fine. So you talked about working in the health centers and working at the restaurant. How do you spend your time, first of all? Is the restaurant your, your hobby and Alyssa's main thing? Second of all, how are your children educated and what are their ages now? Mm -hmm. And then third and last, how do I get a t-shirt? <laughs> I, I wanna buy a t-shirt, how do I do that? Uh, I will work on the t-shirt part with you. I'll give you my card. We actually get a lot of requests for, for those t-shirts and we print them in Kenya uh, on this organic cotton that supports a wildlife uh, preservation program there. Uh, but they are extremely popular. I think Alyssa might have figured out a way to get them over here. I think there might even be a supply, secret supply. So we'll talk about that after hours. Um, so I, I divide my time, uh, almost all of my time is actually spent on the health side. Uh, during the early years of heaven, uh, I would work all day and then come in and be at the restaurant helping Alyssa. And those were really hard years. Those were really tough times for, for us uh, when you know, day by day, month by month, the restaurant would barely clear a profit and oftentimes we were subsidizing it. But those days are over. And uh, with the end of those days over the last couple of years, I've really backed off. So I get to do what I think I'm pretty good at, which is critiquing. Uh, so I critique the food. Whenever the new specials are on the menu, uh, we actually sit down with the chef a couple days beforehand, sit at the bar, we go through the whole menu and give feedback and figure out what can be done better. Uh, we are constantly trying to improve and we're also constantly trying to get the staff to focus on um, what can be produced sustainably and locally. So we are very much farm to table. There are a lot of places, I mean, so the Serena Hotel in Kigali, which is the top hotel right now in the country, imports all their protein and a lot of what they sell in their restaurant from Kenya. I mean, that seems ludicrous to us. Why aren't we supporting the farmers who are right here at home? So Alyssa is very much focused on that. We were the first restaurant ever to serve, for example, banana flower salad. No one had ever even known that you could eat a banana flower in Rwanda, but, but that's very, uh, a very popular special on the menu from time to time. So uh, these days we will go in a couple nights a week, and then we started serving brunch on the weekends, which has become a big hit, and we're always in with the family. So in terms of education, so Maya, who's sitting on my lap there, and Elodie, uh, who's just to my right, but your left, uh, are at the Earth School, which was actually the first Montessori in Rwanda. They're having a fantastic time. They're getting a great, great education and loving it. And Eli, who's on Alyssa's lap, is uh, still at a little preschool in our neighborhood called Petit Calin, run by a Belgian woman who was actually born in Rwanda. She's second generation uh, to be there. And, and he'll probably start the Earth School with them soon. And then this is our extended family. So one of the one of the toughest things that actually happened just as I was finishing up the book was that our housekeeper passed away uh, in part from complications from HIV, um, even though she was on antiretroviral therapy. And uh, she was a single mom. And uh, we're now caring for her kids. And so her kids are there uh, in the photograph. So that's Claudine on the right and Welcome and Letitia. And we've got them enrolled in the day boarding program at Green Hills, which is the top prep school in the country. And they're doing so well. W when we first put them in, we were scared. And we actually sat down with the principal of the school. And the principal said, I, you know, give this a couple of years. We're going to see how it goes. These are kids who haven't really been exposed to the same sort of education that all the other kids at the school have. 
And uh, I was just in for parent-teacher conferences two weeks ago, and both Claudine and Welcome are on the honor roll. Actually, Welcome is on the high honor roll. So they're doing really well. Any other questions? Yes, sir, the microphone's coming right to you. So glad to see you here. Um, confess, I was born and raised in Uganda, and I was in, Nisawa -sawa. in Kigali <laughs> in December. Uh -huh. And Dean may have told you we, we had a student here at the Clinton School in Mercury, and I got in touch. I told her there's this gentleman coming from Rwanda. Did you, have you ever met? She said no, but I think you are going to meet soon. Great. My question is a global one, um, uh, an African question with regard to development. Uh, I was moved when I visited Rwanda just three days and saw it, stuff on the ground. And I was able to, to drive, uh, well, to take a trip all the way to Kibeho, which is about three hours away, and I saw organized development all the way. So my question is, uh, having been on the ground for 10 years or so, what does it take to move Africa in, that, in, in the direction of Rwanda? Elsewhere, Tanzania did not have chaos. We have some models, but Rwanda is unique. What are the characteristics of Rwanda that has uh, moved us that way? I'd, I'd point to two, and the first is leadership. Rwanda's leadership is exemplary. It's got the highest percentage parliamentarians who are women in the world. It's got a president who shut down and ended the genocide and the civil war. And it's a government that is committed to its people. There's a lot of tough love between the government and the people of Rwanda, and I think that's really important. So people don't expect the government to just be there uh, for a handout. They expect government to build out the foundation for prosperity. So I think that's the first. Uh, you gotta start with leadership, you gotta start with vision and ambition, and without a great leader, it's gonna be really tough to get it done. Probably the second piece uh, which is linked to the first, is people have to be able to count on their security and stability. If there's no security and stability in their lives, for example, if, if they think that their lives will be disrupted by a horrible health event, that is a lack of security and stability. Um, if they fear for their lives or they fear for uh, their safety in the streets, that's security and stability. And one of the things that Rwanda has really excelled at has been to improve that environment to levels that are hardly seen anywhere in the entire world. And the result of that is that the people of Rwanda have started to build businesses, have become more entrepreneurial, um, and have started to um, defeat the, the very shackles of poverty um, that have in so many ways impacted them for generation after generation. So I think those are the two and you're right, you go right over the border into Uganda, and suddenly the roads are terrible, uh, the corruption levels are sky high. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a joke in the region, pardon me, because you are Ugandan, but that, uh, you know, in a race between uh, who has a higher corruption level, whether it's Uganda or Kenya, Uganda's only in second place because they paid for that spot. So, um, so it's, it's, it's tragic, right? Because if you take a look at a country like Uganda or a country like Kenya, the natural resource wealth is so much greater. You've got more land, you've got more minerals, ultimately more oil, and yet people seem to be poorer. And that's one of the great ironies in development is that so many of the places on the earth, I mean, look at Venezuela, that have the greatest subsoil assets turn out to be the poorest because those types of riches often enable corruption, um, and they enable that sort of greediness. Rwanda really doesn't have much outside of its people and its beautiful climate. Really, it, it just doesn't. And I think that has forced people to come together and to build something great. 
Let me, before, before I next the next question, I want to introduce a special guest, take a little point of personal privilege, because there's someone here who wanted to come hear you speak, and at some point she's going to come back and speak. But speaking of Uganda, um, as a little girl, she was not able to go to school. Little boys could go to school, little girls couldn't. Uh, and little girl and didn't have the money to pay to go to school. And Heifer International came to her community and brought a goat to her village, to her family. And she became the subject matter of the wonderful children's book, Beatrice's Goat. Beatrice went on to graduate from school. She went to Connecticut College and she came to the Clinton School where she graduated mm -hmm. and she worked in a, uh, and she's now working with Heifer, but she has a very strong interest uh, in promoting initiatives for women and girls. And she happens to be here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Beatrice Bira, the subject of Beatrice's Goat, who has grown up to be an outstanding young woman and Clinton School alumni. Welcome home, Beatrice. <laughs> Now back to questions. Got a question right here. I got it. Uh, this question may be way too personal, and if you choose not to respond, I'll certainly understand. I'm curious where your financial support comes from, because it seems to me, from a middle-class American, mm -hmm. that you can't possibly make enough money from your restaurant to send six kids to private school. So do you depend on contributions, on charity, on grant money? How does all that work? All the above, all the above. Yeah, I mean, uh, it would be nice if someday the restaurant were able to support all that. That's, uh, that's certainly the dream, but uh, especially for uh, supporting the kids' education. I mean, you've got a terrific insight. It is not inexpensive to do private schooling and private education in Rwanda. And uh, as a percentage of household income, it's, it's virtually impossible. So we rely on grants. Uh, we've got a lot of family members who make contributions to www.globalhealthbuilders.org uh, to support the kids. Um, and uh, in terms of my work, it, it's interesting. You, you never know how a book is going to be read. And a lot of people's reaction to reading the book is, oh, Ruxin must be fine. He's got it so easy for raising resources and, and doing the work in public health that he does. Uh, the rest of us out there who've got our not, are struggling not for profits, you know, we've, we've got it hard. Uh, that's not the case at all. We are you know, very frequently on a quarterly, year-to-year -year sort of schedule looking for grants, looking for funding uh, to do the incredible work that's done. And you know, one of the things that I didn't mention is that in much the same way you saw that our whole, our, almost our entire staff at Heaven outside of Alyssa uh, is local, is Rwandan. The Health Builders team is also all Rwandan. Uh, we only have two expats on the entire staff of 40 um, because we just believe that that is the way to get the job done and raising the funds to support their salaries and to uh, support the incredible work that they're doing out in the field is tough. And that's what I spend my time on. And, Personally, I actually wrote the book in order to help with that funding because I thought getting that story out and convincing people that there is another approach to development and that its genesis is in Rwanda and it's being done by the government and it's being done by a lot of the organizations that are there uh, is the way to go. Um, that, that, was, uh, that was the whole dream. And uh, it's made it a little bit easier, but not easy. It's still incredibly difficult to get donors and to get social impact investors behind what's happening there. Very challenging. And, okay, Beatrice, you got I a question. I thought you were going to ask me, by the way, about my love life, which my editor took out of the book. They, there's only a little allusion to, to Alyssa's love life, and, and my editor actually said to me, well, nobody's going to be introduced, interested in your history, Josh, so we're going we're gonna to take out those, those pieces of text. Thank you, Josh, for coming to present to us. I really like your um, social enterprise approach to development. I think, actually, that's really the best way for Africa to develop. I actually have a question. I'd like to assume that uh, through your restaurant business, you've had a chance to 
interact with farmers directly also. Uh, my question is, do you purchase your, your food uh, directly from the local farmers or not? And do you think that the farmers do get a good value for their produce? And um, I ask that because there is this um, belief out there in the international development world that uh, if subsistence farmers can um, market their produce collectively, they have um, a higher bargaining power and they can access um, wider channels of um, you know, wider markets to sell their produce either within or outside of the country. Um, what's, what's your belief about that? So first of all, Alyssa and the team at Heaven actually do cultivate close relationships with a number of farmers. It's usually more around specialty items. So for example, we've had artichokes on the menu lately, uh, which comes from the former Mbabazi orphanage uh, up, uh, out, out towards Gaseni. Uh, and wherever possible, we try to work with those farmers who are being trained in organic practices. And we are happy, overwhelmingly happy, to pay uh, top franc for high quality produce. Unfortunately, world markets and restaurants in Kigali oftentimes resemble each other, where it's sort of a race to the bottom. Who's going who's gonna to give me the cheapest tomato? Who's going to give me the cheapest uh, piece of chicken? And we just don't believe in that. We believe that where the value is, is in these specialty products and actually improving what the farmers are producing so that they can earn higher incomes. Now, you ask. And, and by the way, thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, I'm going to have to get you to autograph a, a copy of the book about you. Uh, that my kids will love. Uh, the, uh, the real development question is, can there be a transition in a country such as Rwanda or Uganda or Kenya where the vast majority of people are farmers on dwindling plots of land, is there a way to help them transition, create some wealth for themselves, and ultimately uh, for their children? I believe that those high value products probably are part of the answer, but I think that we've got to think about this holistically. So if you've got, how many brothers and sisters have you got? Six. Yeah. So if you've got six brothers and sisters, <clears throat> and you've got a half hectare plot of land, it is extremely hard, almost regardless of what you're producing, to produce enough income to send kids to private school, to get good education, and to break that cycle of poverty. And so I think one of the reasons with our health work, we focus a lot on family planning and access to family planning, for example, is that you need that combined sort of approach of Ultimately, having fewer kids, being more productive on the land, producing higher value products, uh, getting better education for your kids in order to break out. And can everyone do that? I think that's the dream, right? I mean, for the vast majority of Americans, that was realized during the Industrial Revolution. The problem is, you can't do light and mid manufacturing in a number of these countries because electricity is expensive or transport's expensive or the inputs are expensive. So what is going to cause that to happen? In Rwanda, the government believes that investment in knowledge and in industry, the industry that's in here, the industry that flows uh, over the internet is gonna be the way out. I think in the meantime, there's industries that can be invested in that are going to create those types of opportunities. Heaven's a great example. Very low barrier to enter the restaurant industry. To deliver high value is extremely difficult. But when you do, the Solanges and the others uh, on the staff can actually make excellent incomes. So it's a challenge across the board. And I wish the world were more focused on trying to figure out some of those solutions, because I think that there's great opportunity. Yes, we have a question right here. Um, hi, thank you for being here today. I'm actually a freshman at Columbia University, and I'm taking a class called Fundamentals of Global Health. And um, one issue that we talk a lot about is access to primary health care centers. Mm -hmm. 
and how there's a lot of problems with that and that the staff isn't in there or it's closed at bad times. Mm -hmm. And people do not trust those primary health care centers, so they go to the hospitals. And so there isn't enough proper development of the primary health care centers, and then just the hospitals are so overrun. And I was wondering what the case is in Rwanda. I know you said there's a lot of primary health care centers that are working, but like, are, how efficient are they and how um, do they relate to the hospitals? Are there, do people trust the primary health care centers more or do they go to the hospitals a lot? Rwanda is a real exception because the government cares about the public's health and recognizes that that's a key to prosperity. So there's over 400 primary health care facilities and uh, those facilities are open around the clock, are reasonably well staffed, uh, most of them provide family planning, um, have a good stock of essential medicines. Most, if not all of them, will treat with antiretrovirals, have treatment for malaria. So you can't really compare Rwanda to any other place. What I like to do is ask the other places, the other countries, why can't you at least do as well as Rwanda with your resources? So I think it's, uh, I think it's a big puzzle. And increasingly, of course, you're right, the private sector is moving in. So in Kigali, you can actually see the private sector is moving in and displacing, to some degree, the public health system. But I think that that can actually be a productive uh, exchange. I think if the private sector forces the public sector to improve its services, that's a really good thing for the, for the client. The problem I have is that in so many countries, there is no public health system to begin with. And so everybody's just turning to private care. And then it's just a question of haves and have nots. And you can say the same thing about education as well. And that's, that's where the biggest challenge is. We've just set our sights too low on what we expect of governments in, in poor countries. We actually have to be a lot more demanding. Not, not, not to be you know, imperialistic about it, but we just have to be more demanding of countries that we reach out to with aid and support and say, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to expect you to actually have a modicum of care, a, a, a modicum of education. Okay. Did you have a question over here? Thank you, Josh, for yes. illustrating the beauty and the opportunity in Rwanda. It's Thank you for being a customer <laughs> in heaven. <laughs> yes, I can attest that heaven's a beautiful, beautiful space <laughs> and delicious food. Um, my question is, uh, there's a huge entrepreneurial spirit going on in Rwanda right now. And you spoke about industry and job creation, which is, I think, a, a challenge in Rwanda, that mm -hmm. there's so many people that are actually becoming more and more well-educated, but there aren't enough jobs to support mm -hmm. that community. So what jobs do you find are most sustainable? What industries are most sustainable? And what jobs are Rwandans most excited about from your perspective? I think it's all going to come down to uh, tourism and potentially education and then potentially sort of other industries and in, in other areas. And I think Rwanda is very much focused on taking what they do produce. So for example, coffee, which you know something about, and tea, and figuring out how to get into these specialty markets and figure out how to create higher value products. And I think they're doing the same thing in tourism and in these other areas. I think the question and the challenge is, even with a lot of investment in those areas, how many jobs can you create? And we, we don't really have an answer to that. And, and what you point out is absolutely true, that there are a lot of educated Rwandans out there who are looking for work. And that is a big problem. Part of it, I think, comes down to culture. Because oftentimes, my experience is that a kid will have a university degree and think, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to heaven and I want to be a manager. And we'll say, well, what have you ever managed? And we'll, we'll set them up as a steward in the back cleaning the dishes to work through the line and ultimately come up through the ranks to be a server, a manager. And so creating lots of businesses, or uh, as my good friend Dr. Blaise Karabushi uh, said, you know, creating a thousand heavens. A thousand heavens would create tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs and create those opportunities for learning and for skills. Because university is great, uh, and graduate school is fantastic too, Skip. But ultimately, ultimately, it's about practice, right? It's about practice. And 
if you live in a country where there's several hundred of those opportunities versus the thousands and, and tens of thousands that are needed, then there's a real disconnect. Uh, and so that's what I think, that's what we're all focused on. But we've already seen a lot of growth. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in the tourism sector, a lot of growth in some of these um, agriculture-based industries. Foreign direct investment is rising. People realize I'd rather do business in Rwanda than a place that's really corrupt where I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Uh, one other area that I would just mention is construction. So construction, especially in a relatively poor country, is a massive source of employment. And if you take a look at the skyline in Rwanda today, it is dotted with skyscrapers going up, uh, uh, all sorts of buildings going up, all sorts of construction work. So that's another fantastic source. But at the same time, cement is incredibly expensive because it's not produced locally, so it has to be imported. So it's, it is not easy. It is not easy, not across any dimension. Well, let me just say this, Josh, thank you very much for being with us. I hope people will come and visit with him, talk to him individually, and purchase Thousand Hills to Heaven, Love, Hope, and a Restaurant in Rwanda. Josh, thank you very much. Thank you, Skip.